Fabulous. Thank you so much. And apologies again to everyone uh, for the technical difficulties on my part. <clears throat> so welcome. Thank you for joining me this morning. My name is Dr. Phoenix Alexander, and I'm the science fiction collections librarian at the University of Liverpool. And I work in the library and special collections and archives. And I curate the largest collection of science fiction in Europe. And it's a, an amazing job. It's it's a great honor, a great privilege, and it's a lot of fun. And so today I'm going to talk you through um, a bit about the work of special collections and archives as they relate to science fiction in particular, show you some treasures from uh, our collection and speak more broadly about, I guess, self archiving as a creative person or as an author and um, the kinds of things you, you can do to really build your own archive as, as an artist. So um, without further ado, let me get started. Uh, just to start on a basic level, and this is something that I didn't find out <laughs> until I was in grad school, what are special collections and archives? Now, forgive me if this is obvious to, to some of you, but um, special collections are usually printed materials of unique or significant provenance. For instance, books owned by a particular author or a particular figure, and these texts will typically have uh, provenance in terms of markings or signatures or annotations that show that they belonged to a certain person. Now, unlike a regular library where you can, you, you know, you go into a library, you check out a book, you take it home, bring it back. Special collections materials are usually only accessed within a reading room. So what might happen is you email uh, the library, the, the department, you book an appointment and you are allocated a time slot where you can actually look at these materials in a sort of uh, bound environment, shall we say. <clears throat> and archives, on the other hand, they can also encompass printed materials such as books, pamphlets, magazines, and so on. But um, they usually are a bit more diverse in their formats. Archives, again, are usually associated with a particular writer or institution. Uh, and you can find many strange and wonderful things from um, teeth to crisp packets. I'll mention, <laughs> I'll talk about that later later to typewriters to games to video or basically any any kind of object that is important or was important to an author's life you might find in an archive so th those are the differences between the two two aspects of, of my department at least this is uh just the hub site for uh special uh some of the science fiction collections at liverpool i'll just throw some numbers at you quickly uh, we have over 35,000 books, 2,500 critical works, 2,500 periodicals, as well as about 15 notable archives of some of the major science fiction writers, British science fiction writers of the 20th century. So you can see some names there that you might be familiar with. John Wyndham, Olaf Stapledon, John Brunner, Eric Frank Russell, and um, others. Now, our collections are a combination of materials owned by the University of Liverpool ourselves and the Science Fiction Foundation. And again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with this institution, so forgive me if this, is, if this is information you already know. But the Science Fiction Foundation is one of the largest um, educational, charitable institutions of science fiction in the UK. It was founded in 1971. Uh, you can see the little manifesto on the on the left hand side of the slide there and it publishes foundation which is one of the seminal critical journals of science fiction <clears throat> and our patrons are neil gaiman and Naylor hopkinson and professor davis southwood here that there was uh sorry in the last slide you saw that was neil gaiman actually in the store and this is him again with my predecessor andy sawyer who was at liverpool for many years and did did fantastic work and so our collections um, are stored essentially in the same in the same uh, building in the same department, and uh, the foundation's collection covers periodical runs, print uh, printed books, uh, author archives, editorial archives. We have the Interzone archives, for instance, and it's just an amazing resource. And they're a really fantastic institution that you should check out. <clears throat> oh, another strength of the science fiction collections, I should say, are the Terry Pratchett holdings. So this, this is a, these are a couple of images of them down in the stacks, and we have pretty much every single Terry Pratchett book in print, including uh, 
translations. And some of my favorite items are some old video games and ephemera relating to Terry Pratchett, which are just great fun to work with. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about the projects we do with the Pratchett materials later on. And so that was just a whistle stop tour through what we have at Liverpool, the Science Fiction Foundation and, and their work. Now I'm gonna get onto the fun bit and show you all some items from the collections. So you might recognize this magazine. Uh, let me just move, see if I can move this bar out of the way. No, okay, that's fine. <clears throat> we'll hang out with that at the top. Um, this is the first issue of Amazing Stories uh, from 1926, April 1926, uh, edited by Hugo Gernsback, of course, and this is largely considered to be um, a, a defining moment in science fiction publishing. This is the first periodical of its kind that explicitly uh, aimed to carve out a space for what Gernsback calls scientific fiction. So um, he talks about this in his editorial note here. It might be a bit small, but you can see at the top there, uh, the subtitle is The Magazine of Scientific Fiction. And Gernsback aimed to combine the scientific romance or adventure story of the 19th century with a forward facing um, engagement, like narrative engagement with scientific developments. And as you can see from the table of contents, you've got some pretty uh, big names, Edgar Allan Poe, H.G. Uh, Wells. And what I find really interesting, if you ever, I mean, reading reading magazines now, uh, you, you know, in, in 2021, I always find it fascinating to read the editorial notes or the editorial introductions, because you can kind of see, you know, science fiction is, a, it's a pretty small community, I would say. And you, you certainly get the sense that it was even smaller, I think, uh, going back into the 20th century. And I often find it's worth looking at these editorial introductions to get a sense of, okay, what, what is the context in which I'm going to receive these stories? What is the, uh, what is the sort of intervention of this magazine? And uh, this is just one, one, one example of that in our, in our archives. And again, this is a very delicate piece. It, it's, 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 I mean, it's almost a hundred years old and it, it just, it just gives me such a thrill when, when I see it in this little shrink wrap pocket uh in in the archive so <clears throat> that's that's one object that's a particular favorite and this object i'm going to have a sip of coffee and tell you why this object really made me cry <clears throat> so this is a not the because he had many personal typewriter of arthur c clark now uh, the science fiction collections at liverpool were fortunate enough to acquire the personal library of arthur c clark that was in December 2019, right before COVID and the associated uh, lockdowns and so on. But um, as I mentioned in my definition of special collections and archives, the library is predominantly print materials, so, so print books and pamphlets and so on. But it also encompassed some archival objects such as uh, videos, video recordings, uh, games, so some amazing old CD-ROM games that we have, um, and this particular object. Now, this is a Remington noiseless portable typewriter from around 1945, and it was on this model that Clark wrote um, his famous article on uh, geostationary satellites for Wireless World magazine. Um, you can see uh, this, this, this is these are images of the magazine. These are not from our from our holdings. But the the, ti the title of the article is Extraterrestrial Relays, and it basically laid out the science for geostationary satellite communications almost 20 years before it became a reality. And it's just, I mean, to, to see to see that the physical object on which this was written and this was theorized was a very moving experience <laughs> for me personally. Because, and it's hard to describe because I, I'm not one for... Um, I guess nostalgic materialism in some sense. Um, I always try and keep 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 the mindset that you know these are these are human beings. You know that we have the frequent association of science fiction writers as prophets or as a kind of um, as these kind of magical beings, which which they are, <laughs> of course. But just something about the physicality of opening the box, the smell of it, the sensory just experience of this this object was very very um surprisingly overwhelming and i think that was one of the great early joys of of doing this work 
and you know it's 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 a piece of history it's a piece of uh, science fiction history it's a piece of scientific history as well and uh, it's just a beautiful object so that's again another one of my personal favorites from our collections <clears throat> oh and shout out um if you want to see more items from the clark library i put together a website the url is at the top here and this is just the the home page uh so you can check that out and you can see some more objects from the libraries and it and it's organized in a way that takes you through his career not strictly chronologically but um i tried to include as many um, images as possible so you can get a sense of his life his work and what, what we have here at liverpool these are time scales for last and first men so uh, um, if anybody's read the works of Olaf Stapledon, he did um, Star Maker and, and this particular uh, novel, Last and First Men. Um, these are hand drawn on graph paper time scales of basically human civilization as he imagined from the beginning of time right to the very end or beginning of human existence. And um, again, the the images are quite images quite small, but you can see just. The, the level of detail, the, the obsessive, very satisfying arrangement of lines of text. <clears throat> and the, this particular item is actually really, really fragile. Um, and so, because it, it's on graph paper, as, as you can see. So we actually use facsimiles, uh, high quality color photocopies for researchers coming in to look at. We, we don't actually give access to <clears throat> these originals just because they are so delicate. And I want to pause, I guess, at this moment and to encourage anyone, you know, not just authors, but an artist, a creator, or really any, really anyone, honestly. I think what special collections and archives can do is sort of encourage what I call a mindfulness of objects. So as we go through our lives, we, we create a paper trail, if that makes sense, whether it's a bus ticket or a train ticket to go see a show or a receipt from, you know, from a coffee shop where we were writing, all of these objects build up a picture of our lives. And this is obviously an example of, um, you know, plotting, planning, world building, we might say in science fiction. So if you're doodling, you know, jotting sketches of alien life forms in a particular story you're working on or jotting down ideas or, you know, physical notes of how you feel in a day, I would encourage you all to really sort of um, treasure those, those moments in ways that you might not realize. Uh, and certainly, you know, have, I mean, if you want to, of course, <laughs> not everyone is interested in self archiving, but I think being aware of the kinds of objects we leave behind and the kinds of um, traces we leave behind is, is really important and something that's, that's often easy to overlook. Uh, and yeah, whether, whether, you, whether you have the aim of donating your archive to a library or, or an institution, or whether you just want to remember <laughs> what, what, what a particular exhibit was like, you know, 20 years ago. I think it's a practice that I would really recommend everyone do. Uh, just for a day, just for a week, see what happens. You know, keep, keep all these physical objects. Now, it's interesting to think about um, digital technologies and digital archives. Now, this is a whole, this is a whole kind of sphere that libraries uh, and archives are starting to, to try and collect and try to reckon with. And obviously those are just as meaningful as physical objects, but um, yeah, try, try and keep that mindfulness uh, in, in one's self-archiving. Um, because there are people out there who would love to see, you know, in the future who would love to go back and see, okay, oh, okay, what, um, what date did this author predict, you know, the heat death of the universe, as in this case, <laughs> in these timescales, or, you know, I wonder what this particular person felt about X. Um, write that down, because it, it is a gift. It, it is a gift to, to folks in the future. Anyway, that was a little bit cheesy, a little bit romantic. I do apologize. Also, not, I don't really apologize, because <laughs> that, that's, kind of that's kind of why I love this work <clears throat> now this is the first issue of interzone another first uh, if you remember we saw the amazing stories just a few slides ago and um, interzone if you don't know it's, it's one of again the seminal science fiction publications based in the UK I think with TTA press at the minute who also published black static 
And again, this is just a, a snippet of the editorial introduction. Um, and this particular editorial again states its intervention being um, for 10 years or more, there has been a gap in British magazine publishing. We have lacked a popular magazine devoted to intelligent science fiction and fantasy. Interzone is a new attempt to close that gap and to bring before a fairly wide but discerning readership the best fantastic fiction we can find. Now, what's interesting, just as the amazing stories contained um, a combination of very high profile names and newer writers, I think this issue does kind of the same thing. So if you see the first issue contains um, contributions from Angela Carter, John Harrison, Michael Moorcock, Keith Roberts, and John Slade. Um, so writers with more established reputations. But um, they go on to say that our second issue will also feature several uh, well-established names, but also run stories by new writers. And I think this is something really interesting to think about. Um, even today, you know, when a new magazine opens, um, I mentioned that the science fiction publishing world is, is fairly small. Science fiction communities are very small, fairly small, I should say. And so looking at these kinds of archival or, or um, special collections objects really lets you trace the networks of who was reading who, who was editing who, you know, who is who's included in, in an anthology and who isn't. And um, again, sort of I encourage an, an attentive, attentiveness to the ecosystem, you might call it, the literary ecosystem of science fiction, or indeed any literary genre that you care to think about. And um, it's always surprising seeing, you know, oh, I didn't realize that this editor was talking to this person. These are the kinds of insights that you can get from, from special collections and archives. <clears throat> and this is, a really uh, interesting and notable and and quite fun example of of this kind of uh, this kind of interventional work. Um, we also we have a huge zine collection in uh, Liverpool. Zines being um, sort of often one off renegade underground publish uh, publishing. Um, it's not a full fledged zines aren't full fledged magazines necessarily though they can be. They can be very um, uh, produced to a very high quality and distributed and sold. But um, they're usually, I mean, at least in the 20th century, um, printed by a lithograph and, and stapled together or just printed out on someone's printer and circulated among a group of fans. And so what you're seeing here is a, uh, this is actually from a blog post on our website that you can check out later. But it's um, the first issue of Themazine. Femazine was uh, founded in 1954 and it was framed as a space uh, for femme fans or female fans of science fiction and it purported to be edited by women um, have content solicited and included from women and um, even though it, it's ironic because it has you know a scantily clad lady on the front cover of this of the first issue the editorial note um, goes on to say uh, so it might it might be from this issue or maybe the issue number two saying that um, take one one last look gents because this is not this is not coming back. <laughs> We're going to do, uh, we are not going to pander to, uh, you know, lascivious gazes on, for our covers. <clears throat> but if, you, so there are 15 issues of Femazine that were released from 1954 to 1960. And I feel slightly bad spoiling the big spoiler, but I mean, I, I kind of have to in this <laughs> presentation. Um, issue nine, in issue nine, it was revealed, it, the bombshell that, um, it was actually founded by a male editor who was hiding out, I think, in Egypt somewhere and going under a pseudonym. Um, and it, the, the, the issue, I mean, it, it was a very theatrical issue. It, I think in giant letters it says hoax on the front of it. And um, it, it honestly caused stirs in the science fiction community. Now, issue 10 came out following this and uh, the magazine had tried to change its name. It, 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 it well, it attempted to change its name and rebrand itself in light of this. So um, it actually has a picture of a phoenix with the word uh, distaff on the front on the front of it. Supposedly, it's a new title, uh, and this didn't work. People didn't like we <laughs> didn't like the new title, so it went back to Femazine for another few issues, and then sadly, issue fit number fifteen was was the final issue. And in the editorial notes, again, the the new editor says, you know, I. I would love more content. I, I really wish you would send me stuff. Essentially, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, um, but at the minute, you know, it's too much work, and, I, and I'm not going to do it. So, um, it, it was sad, but 
it, this is kind of just one of the many bizarre but important stories I think you can find in in zines and what's interesting about zines in particular and this one especially is that it responds to other zines directly so actually um, one of the one of the articles um, in this issue uh, responds to a very misogynist article that appeared in another zine that was listing the five you know five types of, of female science fiction fans and just very misogynist and very very um, unpleasant and this this zine sort of tore it down and, and clapped back. And I, I guess you might call this, I mean, it, it, in contemporary parlance, it could be, you know, the Twitter exchange or the Twitter spat or the forum, you know, uh, dispute or, or not just dispute, but, you know, um, championing, championing of each other's works. These are sort of the physical versions of that. And zines are so fun to look at because you just don't, you honestly don't know what you're going to find. <laughs> you can see, you can see the names of fans, you know, who are writing sometimes unless they use pseudonyms, but it's almost like a, I think you're much more likely to get stream of consciousness, ad lib thoughts, maybe not the most formally put together, certainly not, um, you know, I mean, they can be academically rigorous or intellectually rigorous, but oftentimes it can just be rants. You know, I, I really hate this movie is trash or um, this article's trash and I'm gonna tell you why. And they're just a lot of fun to look at. <laughs> so um, Femazine, really important example of a, a zine. And again, I would encourage you all to seek out and even make your own zines. You know, you can, you can literally put them together with anything. You can do it digitally. Um, of course, you can use Word or whatever, publisher, um, procreate if, you, if you're artistically minded or just, you know, get some sheets of paper and write some notes do an illustration, collage something, staple it together, and there you have your own zine that would certainly, again, be a gift to someone in the future if they wanted to know what you were thinking about a sci-fi book or a movie or, or um, anything that's sort of contemporary to your time. <clears throat> so I feel like I, I almost feel like I'm an arts and crafts <laughs> person here. Uh, but talking of, talking of which, so um, those are a few highlights. I'll talk a little bit about myself and um, I guess I'll just end by um, talking a bit about how to get into this kind of work and how I got here. So I had a pretty unconventional career path, I would say. I initially trained as a fashion designer in, Lond in London. I should say I'm from Cyprus originally. I was born there and moved to England when I was five and um, decided sci uh, science fiction was for me, but fashion design was not for me. <laughs> so I then switched and studied literature, did my uh, BA and MA and then uh, went to grad went to the US for grad school. And while I was at grad school, I, I stumbled across the Beinecke Library and I, I just thought, what on earth is this? This is what it looks like from the outside, I should say, if anybody's visited it. It's this huge, I mean, just incredible, giant <laughs> marble building. And I remember walking in for the first time, you can see in the background of this image what the sort of main atrium looks like it's just a huge glass tube full of books and I just thought oh my goodness what is what is this strange arcane place that is attached to the university but is something very very different and long story short I I fell in love with doing research using special collections materials and, and uh, I'm going to show um, how I spent one of the best summers of <laughs> my life basically doing work there. So as soon as I, as soon as I found out, I was like, okay, I have to get, see if I can get work experience, see if I can volunteer, um, because this is just incredible. You know, I, I want to find out more about this, this world while I'm doing my studies. And um, I was really, really fortunate enough to be asked a couple of years in to um, go to Philadelphia to acquire the library of Samuel R. Delaney, who needs no introduction, one of the, you know, amazing, amazing grandmasters of science fiction. And it, it was it was a very memorable trip. We had about 24 hours to get, get uh, I think around 300 boxes whittled down. No, sorry, 500 boxes to something like 300. Um, Chip Delaney was there himself. We met him um, and Dennis, his partner. It was, it was a really lovely time. Very, very fast paced. The, the storage facility was boiling. I almost included a picture but I thought, um, yeah, everyone's sort of scantily clad. <laughs> so it's not, it wasn't appropriate for this, but um, this is this is a picture that the, what you can see on screen now, this is a picture of the boxes that made it to Beinecke in the Beinecke stores. Um, they were kind of 
sort of organized by format in terms of magazines or graphic novels and books and so on, but m they were mostly un unorganized. So this is what the collection looked like when it got to Beinecke. And then my, my summer, I spent three months, I think this must have been maybe around 2017, something like that, 2017, I believe, was spent unpacking all of these boxes and sorting it out on the shelf to um, be ready for cataloging. Now, uh, this might be a bit boring for some of you, but <laughs> I'm going to mention it because it is a very important part of what we do. Um, how, how you organize a collection on a shelf really sort of should align with how it's going to be cataloged. So um, you kind of have to assess as you go along what will be most useful to researchers to look at. <clears throat> so I started with Delaney, works by Delaney himself, then works that Delaney read, um, that include provenance that I mentioned earlier, whether it's his annotations or um, notes, in, you know, tucked inside a book or something like that. And then items without provenance, so just books that he owned and maybe just had a signature of some kind. <clears throat> and then finally, you know, magazines, periodicals, zines, etc. at the end. So it went from this at the beginning of the summer to this. And this just brings me <laughs> so much joy. It was so fun and satisfying doing this work. Um, again, you might not be able to make out the details, but from left to right, there's Delaney's works, his library with provenance, <clears throat> um, fiction, nonfiction, and, and then all the magazines and periodicals at the end. You can kind of see them in the archive boxes there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, this is the kind of work, this is kind of, um, it's it's not just it, it's administrative work, but it's also you really get a sense of a duty of care or or a, a, an attitude of care towards these objects. Um, this is this, these are texts that somebody has been collecting for most of their life, and it's a frequently very emotional thing to to give you know or, or to give up those objects to an institution that or you know a person or a team that is going to look after it and honor it and store it carefully for you. Um, and I'm just extrapolating now from the example of Delaney himself. But um, again, it's something to think about, you know, as, as, as we go through life and whether we we're, whether we create things artistically or not. Um, what happens to our objects is often, I think, can often be overlooked. And again, another reason why I love the kind of work that I do is that you in some ways, you you might think, oh, we're librarian is you you're just down in the stacks, you're sorting out stuff, you know, you're you're responding to queries, but it's a very people oriented job in that you know you are frequently talking with folks who are still you know still living, of course, um, and sort of talking through their plans and their wishes for their for their legacies, how they're going to be stored, protected, honoured and also how they're going to be accessed by people. You know, I think a lot of authors and writers really want folks in the future to come and read their stuff or to come and study them or, you know, to um, see see what, what they cared about and what they wrote about. That these, aren't, these aren't objects that we want to keep locked away in a store for nobody to see. These are objects that we hope will have, will go on to have um, other lives, uh, in other lives and for other lives. So again, a, a slightly romantic attitude, <laughs> uh, but that's just my my perspective on this kind of work. And and again, this is one example. This was this was a really formative example of like, oh my goodness, I'm so lucky to be able to do this, and I want to I want to um, share that joy with others, with future researchers and visitors. <clears throat> so I've touched upon this briefly. Um, what does a science fiction collections librarian do? So my job, it's kind of a hybrid of curator and academic in that I teach, I publish things, but I also do the work of a librarian in terms of, as you saw, acquiring materials, processing them, cataloging them. And again, the pleasure is having that, um, I guess, dual aspect to the work, you know, the administrative side of things, uh, processing side of things, and then seeing how those texts, how those materials are then used in a wider ecosystem, not just of the university or an academic context, but how we disseminate um, them to the general public, you know, via exhibits, via outreach events, workshops, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's bringing people in and it's also bringing the work out to the world. <clears throat> uh, just another quick uh, snapshot of some more 
uh, text that, <laughs> that I acquired. Um, part of what part of the work of a librarian is, you know, you come in and you see, okay, what are the strengths of the collections? We have a particularly strong, for instance, uh, showing of 20th century text, but I wanted to um, really start to shore up some of the earlier earlier uh, time periods that, that we don't have as many texts of. So these are early 20th century science fiction texts from the collection of George Locke, who was a prolific collector of science fiction. Uh, this is the Clark Library. So, as you mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, with the Delaney materials, often they look like this. You know, you, you go to a storage facility and they're just boxes and um, files lying around. And again, it's sort of like Christmas because you don't really know. You, you have a rudimentary, uh, I guess, look at the materials, you know, when they're in a storage facility. But it's not until you bring them back to a library that uh, you can really dig around and see, okay, what, what on earth is in here? So, um, that's what the Clark Library looked like. And this is a snapshot of what it's looking like now. It's still a work in progress. I'm still in the process of doing um, what I showed with the Delaney materials. So again, organizing it in terms of the formats of text, uh, the type that, you know, the types of uh, the types of objects and so on. And like the Delaney, I started with text from Clark himself. So you can see here, these are all uh, texts by Arthur C. Clark, uh, including translations. And it's it's just amazing. I mean, Clark is one of my favorite authors personally. This this story in the corner here, the nine billion names of God, I still find terrifying <laughs> even to this day. And it's it's just wonderful to see to see his works together. You know, the the, the not just that he owned, but I guess the the um of of his work. And I'm just gonna briefly digress here to make a point about this. Uh, this kind of time scale, this kind of time scale that research and special collections and archives can allow. I remember um, I, I did my research at the Huntington Library for my thesis on um, at, Octa at Octavia E. Butler's archive. Now, if 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 you can or if you're in the area, I would 100% recommend checking out this archive. I mean, it is just I mentioned gift earlier. This really is a gift to the world, and I'm not exaggerating here. But what was really interesting, one of the many interesting things about this archive was that um, Butler kept journals from 1970, I think early 1970s, uh, right up until the 2000s, before her untimely death. And I, I read them all. And one thing that's really striking is when you, when you read, when you read correspond, oh, sorry, when you read writing from a person or sort of introspection that spans decades, you can kind of see, you know, oh, this was this was a good time. This was a prolific time, and this was this was a time of struggle, maybe. And again, it, part of it is my own interpretation, obviously. But I found it very moving to kind of um, have that extended snapshot of someone's life, and I call it a gift because I think it's something that it's quite difficult to do in in our own lives. I think, you know, it's sometimes it's only when we come out of a situation or, or look back on it many years and, you know, many years after that we'll say, oh, you know, that was a really, that was a really good time. That was one of the happiest times and I didn't realize it. Or, oh, that was a horrible time. I was really struggling and wow, I, I don't recognize this person writing in this book at this time. Um, and it's something that I know <laughs> there's, there's the, the famous science fiction short story, story of your life that tries to capture this uh, not circular, expansive way of, of of thinking about one's timeline and and the kind of how our actions would change or be determined by what we know to be our, our future. Uh, and again, it's no exaggeration to say that seeing materials like this, um, I think for me at least, really really gets me thinking about those kinds of those kinds of timelines. Um, so again, I encourage a mindfulness, a sort of attentiveness of the objects you collect and and um just just a, a care and a kindness to to oneself as not just as an author or an artist but as a person going through life you know um try try and think about how somebody looking in if we want somebody to look in of course in the future how they that they might think um how, how they might really you know fall in love with our lives and our, our work but again that your mileage may vary some people are happy with with without any access, without giving access to their inner world. And, and for some people, it's enough to, you know, have, have a story or a text out in the world. And it's something that 
that I'm, I'm um, thinking about myself as, as a writer myself. <clears throat> uh, so I've got about seven minutes left. I'll just whiz through the rest. Obviously, we've been in a pandemic, so teaching with special collections materials has been a bit of a challenge. But with this very high tech uh, iPad stand, you can see here and laptops and so on and so forth, I was able to uh, show students how to handle objects. You can see Wild Seed there. I think that's the UK first edition on a on a book rest, as well as do as well as provide digital digitized uh, text on via Canvas and other online platforms that students can access. And uh, I mentioned outreach and engagement in terms of exhibits. Uh, this is again a really, really fun aspect of the job. These are some postcards you can see that I uh, had printed from objects relating to the moon landings. This was for a, a commemorative event a couple of years ago. Uh, it seems like a different, <laughs> different world now. Obviously, this is pre-pandemic. And um, I also put together an exhibit on Afrofuturism for the International Slavery Museum at Liverpool. And again, uh, I had a couple of postcards printed, and it was it was great to bring some text and present them as you can see here for for people to kind of see and browse and um, have reading recommendations essentially on on Afrofuturism. And the the Terry Pratchett collections I mentioned earlier, we are currently working with Senate House Library and Trinity College Dublin to um, eventually create a, a comprehensive digital database for the, the Discworld, for Terry Pratchett's universe. And this was me in, is that me? Yeah, that is me. <laughs> in, in uh, again, 2019, just before, you know, Corona. And um, this was, this was again, a little event at Trinity College Dublin to inaugurate that, that collaboration. So again, this is great fun. You can, um, you, sort of forming these uh, institutional alliances and collaborations to, to, again, bring the materials to the world and just to showcase them to as many folks as possible. And I mentioned publications, brief plug, uh, I've written, I, I write sort of academically and um, in fictional, fictional uh, publications. So you can see a couple of examples of that here. And uh, another shameless plug, <laughs> my, uh, my fantasy and science fiction fiction debut will be coming out next month. I think it's the May, June issue. Uh, I've posted a, an image of it here, but this was a, this was a little uh, review for the Curiosities column in the back. But an actual story of mine will appear in fantasy and science fiction next, or the next couple months, which I'm, I'm still sort of dazed about, <laughs> dazed about how it happened. But, um, and this is something that's important to me, you know, as somebody who is, is both an academic and a librarian for science fiction materials, um, it's also important for me to express myself creatively, you know, as a, as a recovered fashion designer, as I mentioned, as, as a recovered artist, I, I, I love the genre, I love writing, I love words, texts, and it's an honor to both look after them and also, you know, create and circulate texts of my own in the world. Uh, and uh, I'm going to just give a very uh, quick, I guess, pointers of, of uh, a few quick pointers about how to, to do this kind of work. If you're interested in work in libraries and heritage fields, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, really came into it through my research, through the research side of things, and then decided, okay, well, I actually don't want to, I'm more interested in, in the library side of things than the, the full-time academic side of things. Um, and I realize that this it's a privileged position to be able to say this, but seek out as much work experience as you can in, in a local record office or a library, if you have the time and energy, of course. Um, and of, of course, most of these positions are unpaid, unfortunately. Um, but if, if you're in, enrolled in education in any way, or even if you're not, reach out to local um, academics or teachers to see if they have reading lists they can share, um, or even just if they wanted to talk about their experiences. Uh, doing the work just to give you an idea of, okay, is this something that I, I would find interesting and, and would like to do? Um, if you wanted to go down the route and you have the means to do so, you can do um, ALA, which is the American Library Association, um, or uh, SILIP if you're in the UK. You, you can ha uh, do accredited courses to formally train oneself uh, for a library career. And uh, my final point would be, if you are applying for job in the library field, um, read, read the text carefully because a lot of job postings will frequently say um, you need so and so degree or relevant experience. And I think this is really important because if, if, if whatever reason you haven't been able to do a, a formal qualification, 
but you've you've done years of experience you know in an institution or or um you know local office as i mentioned it's still um it's still valued and it's still it's still um, important for your profile and if you're interested in talking about any of um the content that i mentioned today whether it's the sci-fi uh, publishing writing side of things or the library side of things job seeking anything like that uh, i'm more than happy to uh, be contacted so um, here is my email address, my Twitter handle at the bottom, and then also my web, web address. And um, I think that's just about time. So that was a whistle stop tour. Apologies again for the for the technical uh, difficulty on my part at the beginning. And uh, thank you, thank you for for watching.